Chapter One of On the Iron at Big Cloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On the Iron at Big Cloud by Frank L. Packard. Chapter One Raffalgy's Rule. The general manager of the transcontinental system glared at the young man who stood facing him across the office desk. "'Why, you wouldn't last three months,' he snapped. "'I'd like to try, Uncle.' <laughs> "'I'm qualified for the position,' young Holman went on. "'I've done my stint with the construction gangs, and I've spent four years in the eastern shops. You promised me that if I'd stick, I'd have my chance. Well, if I did, I didn't promise to put you in the way of making a fool of yourself and a laughing stock of me, did I? You may be qualified technically. I don't say you're not. In fact, I've been rather pleased with you.' That's one reason why you're not going out there to tackle something you can't handle. If men like Rawson and Williams can't hold down the job, what do you expect to do? No worse than they, at least, Holman answered quietly. Look here, Uncle, that's just the point. There aren't any of the men want the position, so I'm not jumping anybody to take it. I'll not make any laughing stock of you, either. I'm not going out as the old man's nephew, just plain Dick Holman. If I don't make good, you can wash your hands of my railroad career. Young man, said the general manager severely, don't make rash statements. He pushed the papers on his desk irritably to one side, then he frowned. Two years ago, when the road had dug, blasted, burrowed, and trestled its right of way through the mountains, they had built the repair shops for the maintenance of the rolling stock, and from the moment the first brass time check had been issued, the locomotive foremanship of the Hill Division was no subject to be introduced with temerity anywhere within the precincts of the executive offices. One man after another had gone out there, and one after another they had resigned. Hard lot to handle. Carleton, the division superintendent, had replied to the numerous requests for explanation that had been fired at him. And now Dick wanted to go. The general manager's fingers beat a tattoo on the desk, and his frown deepened into a scowl. You're a young fool, he grunted at last and Holman knew that he had gained his point. "'That's very good of you, Uncle,' he cried. "'I knew you'd see it my way. When may I start?' "'I guess you'll get there soon enough,' his uncle answered grimly. He rose from his chair and accompanied Holman to the door. "'Well, go if you want to. But remember this, young man. You're going on your own terms. When you resign from that position, you resign from the road. Understand?' "'All right, Uncle.' Holman laughed in reply. It's a bargain. Three days later, as number one pulled into Big Cloud, Holman swung himself to the platform. Up past the mail and baggage cars, the steam drumming at her safety, a big ten-wheeler was backing down to couple on for the run through the Rockies. There was the pride of proprietorship in his glance as his eyes swept the great mogul critically, for in his pocket was his official appointment as locomotive foreman of the Hill Division, Vice Williams, resigned. It was not until the last of the Pullmans had rolled smoothly past him that he turned to take stock in his surroundings. His first impression was not prepossessing. Before him, just across the yard filled with strings of freight cars, were the low, rambling, smoke-begrimed shops and running shed, while beyond these, again, the town straggled out monotonously. To the westward, through the mountains, were the curves and grades that wrenched and racked and tore the equipment he would hereafter be accountable for. To the eastward, but eastward was only two hundred yards away, for there his eye caught the yard limit post that likewise marked the end of the division. If after this cursory survey there still lingered any illusions of the picturesque in Holman's mind, they were rudely dispelled by the interior of the barn-like structure at the side of the platform that did duty for station, division headquarters, general storeroom, and anything else that might seek the shelter of its protecting roof. The walls were adorned with such works of art as are afforded by the Sunday supplements, interspersed here and there with an occasional blueprint and time schedule. The furnishings bore unmistakable evidence of having seen service with the construction staff when the road was in the making. At the right of the door, as Holman entered, the dispatcher was poring over the train sheet. Sure, said he, in answer to Holman's inquiry. That's the super over there. Holman crossed the room and proffered his credentials. Glad you've come, was Carleton's greeting as he rose and extended his hand. 
We've been expecting you. Williams went east this morning on number two. Sit down. That's your desk there. Holman glanced at the battered table toward which the other pointed, then back again to the four days' growth on the super's face. Carleton grinned. Fixings aren't up to what you boiled shirt fellows down east are used to. Out here on the firing line, most anything goes. I've been requisitioning office fixtures for months. Ain't seen any way bill of them yet. Davis, have you? He called across to the dispatcher. Davis got up with a laugh and joined the other two. No, said he, shaking hands with Holman. Not yet. And not likely to, either, continued the super. It's rough and ready out here, Holman. The staff quarters up there, he jerked his thumb toward the ceiling, are all fired crude, and the Chinese cook is a gilt-edged thief and most persuasive liar. But we've got the finest division of the best railroad in the world, and we're pushing stuff through the mountains on a schedule that makes southern competition sick. We're young here yet. Some day, when the roadbed's shaken down to stay, we'll build the extras. The enthusiasm and bluff heartiness of the super was contagious. Holman put out his hand impulsively. We've heard a lot of you fellows down east, he said, and I'm glad I've got a chance to chip in. His eyes swept around the room and came back to meet the super smilingly. Even if accommodations are below tourist class, he added. So Holman came to the division and joined the staff. Spence, chief dispatcher, had shaken his head. Twenty-eight and locomotive foreman of this division were the roughest, toughest bunch on the system's payroll to handle. <laughs> Hanged if he isn't a decent sort, though. Even if he will shave and wear collars. Imagine Williams with creased trousers. And say, his wardrobe, he's actually got a dress suit with him. <laughs> Wouldn't that ground the wires? Who is he, Carlton? Got a pull with old man? Didn't inquire, returned Carlton bluntly. Let him try out. If the super waited before passing judgment on the latest addition to the staff of the Hill Division, the shop hands did likewise, but for another reason. They waited for Rafferty. Rafferty was boss. Who Rafferty's boss was, was his affair, and it did not concern them. What Rafferty said, went. It was two weeks before he delivered his verdict. A damn pink-faced dude! he announced and terminated his remark with a stream of black-strap juice by way of an exclamation mark. The fiat had gone forth. Down in the pits, stripping the engines of their motion gear, the fitters passed resolutions of confidence in Rafferty's judgment, and among the lathes and planers the machinists did likewise. The concurrence of the forge gang was expressed by a vicious wielding of the big sledges that sent showers of sparks flying from the spluttering metal whenever Holman was sighted coming down the shop on a tour of inspection, a significant intimation to him to keep his distance. And that the sentiment of the shops might not be lacking in unanimity, the boilermakers, should Holman have the temerity to pause for an instant before a shell on which they were at work, would send up a din from the clattering hammers intolerable to anyone but the men themselves whose ears were plugged with cotton waste. As for Holman, he might have been entirely unconscious of the hostility and ill-will of his subordinates for all the evidence he gave of being aware of it. He was busy mastering the routine and details of his new position. For a month he said nothing. Then one morning over at headquarters he turned to Carleton, who was reading the train mail that had just come in. "'Why did Williams resign?' he asked quietly. "'Hm?' said Carleton, startled out of his calm by reason of the suddenness of the question. "'Why did Williams resign?' Holman repeated. "'Oh, I don't know. Tired of life out here, I guess,' Carleton evaded. "'Was it Rafferty?' Carleton turned sharply to scrutinize the other's countenance. Holman was gazing out of the window. "'It was Rafferty.' Carlton admitted after a moment. Holman's gaze never shifted from the window. "'Why wasn't Rafferty fired?' he asked in the same quiet tones, but this time there was just the faintest tinge of accusation in his voice. Carlton's face flushed. An instant's hesitation, then he answered bluntly, "'He weighed more, that's why.' "'Oh,' said Holman significantly. "'Then why didn't you recommend Rafferty for the position long ago and save all the trouble?' Uh. I would have if he could do anything more than sign his name. 
Holman turned angrily to face the super. So, he cried, when a fellow comes out here he has to play a lone hand, hm? A showdown with Rafferty, shop hands in the whole division drawing cards against him. You, Carlton, I didn't put you down as a man with a pet. Carlton got up and put his hand on Holman's shoulder. Don't do it, either, he said quietly. Don't run off your schedule that way, son. It has always been man to man, and I wasn't appealed to. So far it's been all Rafferty. It's easier to get a new foreman than a new shop crew, so I haven't interfered. I don't understand, said Holman blankly. The super laughed shortly. <laughs> Rafferty has the men where he wants them. If he got on his ear, he could tie us up so quick we wouldn't know what happened. A nice thing for me to admit, isn't it? But it's so. I suppose I should have nipped the whole business in the bud, but I kept on hoping that each new man would beat Rafferty at his own game. Has he got you going, too? Holman gathered up the repair reports from his desk and started for the door. Game's young yet, he flung over his shoulder as he went out. From the office, Holman walked up the yard to the spur tracks at the end of the shops where three or four engines were waiting their turn for an empty pit. He glanced at their numbers, comparing them with the papers he held in his hand, then turned and walked back, pausing on the way to inspect an engine, bright and clean as fresh paint and gold leaf would make her, that had been hauled out of the shops that morning. He passed in through the upper doors to the fitting shop. Already another engine had been shunted in to replace the one that had gone out. Her guard plates, links, cross heads, main, and connecting rods were lying on the floor beside her, and the labor gang were jacking and blocking her up preparatory to running the wheels out from underneath her. There was a trace of heightened color in Holman's face as he turned to look for Rafferty. The boss fitter was in his usual place. Down the shop, hands dug deep in his trouser pockets, legs spread wide apart, he swung slowly round and round on the little iron turntable that intersected the handcar tracks where they branched out in all directions through the shops. As Holman approached, he stopped the motion indolently by allowing the toe of his boot to trail along the floor around the table. Holman's manner was quiet and his voice was soft, almost deferential as he spoke. I see you have a 483 finished, Mr. Rafferty. Rafferty looked down from his superior two inches and said, Yes. And, continued Holman, you've run in 840 in her place. Yes said Rafferty, again this time even more indifferently than before. Well, now, really, Mr. Rafferty, I'd like to know why you did it. You know, I told you yesterday to be particular to take 522 next. Holman's tones were more nearly those of apology than of expostulation. For answer, Rafferty gave a little shove with his foot, and the turntable began to revolve slowly. During the circuit, Rafferty coolly gave some directions to the men nearest him, and then, as he was once more come round facing Holman, he stopped. What was it you were saying, Mr. Holman? he drawled. This is the biggest division on the system, isn't it? Holman asked inconsequentially. Huh? demanded Rafferty. Longest division, most mileage, covers quite a stretch of country, Holman amplified. Oh, returned the other with a grin. Well, you'll be thinking so if you ever stay long enough to get acquainted with it. Perhaps that's a reason I'm beginning to feel cramped. I've only been here a month, you know. Holman smiled. What do you mean? Why, curiously, it doesn't seem big enough or wide enough or long enough for even two men. Holman purred his words in soft, mild accents, and Rafferty, understanding, sneered in quick retort. Was you thinking of leaving, Mr. Holman? No, said Holman slowly. I don't know that I was. I thought perhaps the matter might be adjusted, and I'd like to ask your advice. Now, if you were locomotive foreman, and you found that the foreman of this shop, in a dirty, low, underhanded fashion, was discrediting you with the men, and furthermore flatly disobeyed your orders, what would uh, you do, Mr. Rafferty? By the time Holman had completed his arraignment, Rafferty was mad, fighting mad. I'll tell you for what I'd do he yelled, shaking a great horny fist under Holman's nose. I'd plug him good and hard, that's what I'd do, see? Rather drastic, Holman commented after a pause, during which Rafferty drew back, and with hands on hips stood scowling belligerently. But desperate cases sometimes require desperate remedies, and I don't know. 
but that his fist shot out and caught rafferty fairly on the point of the jaw you're right rafferty staggering back from the impact of the blow set the table whirling his feet went out from under him and he fell sprawling to the floor as he picked himself up holman sprang toward him and swinging twice landed two vicious smashes on rafferty's face then except for a confused recollection of a rush of men that was all holman remembered until he opened his eyes to find himself in his bunk at headquarters with carleton bending over him your sight carleton commented grimly what was the muss about holman explained i took rafferty's advice and plugged him you see and after that after that if it hadn't been for old joe the turner running over here to tell us they'd have killed you don't you know any better than to stick up against rafferty like that let alone the whole gang did you expect to do them all up no not exactly i expected there'd be something coming to me but i had to do it i'll admit carleton i was in a blue funk but i just had to moral effect you know yes said carleton savagely the moral effect is great it will be as much as your life is worth to put your head inside those shops again you don't know the men you're dealing with out here you're wrong dead wrong carleton i do you said it was man to man didn't you well then either i'm running the shops or rafferty is rafferty has the men with him because he's a bully and they're afraid of him it was mere force of habit made them pile on to me you wait until they're cooled off a bit and see but carleton shook his head you're a bloomin fool he summed up judicially but here shake you've got your grit with you if you did leave your sense behind for the rest of the morning holman nursed his injuries but at one o'clock he was at his desk again five minutes afterward rafferty came in he was not a pretty sight with his cut lip and battered eye as he limped past both spence and holman with a vindictive glare at the latter he marched straight across the room to where carleton sat he leaned both hands on the super's desk it'll be just a showdown mr carleton that's all there is to it me or him which he announced carleton tilted his chair back put his feet up on the desk and thumbs in the armholes of his vest state your case rafferty he said calmly case rafferty spluttered case is it i'm sick of being bossed by kids out of school that was building blocks when i was building engines i quit or he does rafferty jerked his thumb in holman's direction is that all you have to say rafferty that's about the size of it very well rafferty you can get your time said carleton quietly for a moment rafferty stared as though he had not heard aright all right mr carleton you're the doctor it's satisfied i am when i go out every bloomin man in the shops will go out with me carleton's feet came off the desk like a shot his chair came down to the floor with a bang and the next instant he was standing in front of the boss fitter see here rafferty he blazed you know me the men know me while i've held the bank there's been fifty-two cards in the case and every mother's son of you has had a square deal you know it don't you no man on this division ever came to me with just cause for complaint but had a chance to state his grievance on a clear track and no limit on his permit either now i'm entitled to the same line of treatment i hand out and i won't stand for threats rafferty shifted uneasily to hide his confusion and reached for his chewing we've none again you mr carleton but i'm giving you fair warning he mumbled as his teeth met in the plug when you make trouble on this division you make trouble for me said carleton bluntly as for warning i'll give you warning now that if you start any disturbance in those shops it'll be the worse for you now go they watched him through the windows as he crossed the tracks. Finally, as he disappeared inside the shops, Carleton turned a grave face. I'm afraid it's going to be a bad business, he said. You don't mean to say, Holman burst out, that the men are fools enough to quit just because one man with a grouch says so, do you? I told you that you don't know the class of men out here. They're partisan to the core. It's bred in them. I'm not blaming you, Holman, not for a minute. As I said this morning, I've seen it coming for a long time, long before Williams gave up the ghost. Now it's here. We'll face the music, what? It's mighty good of you to say so, old man, said Holman slowly. But I've put you in a bad hole, and it's up to me to get you out of it. Inside of two weeks with the repair shops on strike, our rolling stock won't be able to handle the traffic. He put on his hat and started for the door. 
Where are you going? Carleton demanded. Rafferty's not going to have this all his own way. The men have no grievance, and I don't believe they'll follow him out if they're talked to right. I'm going over. Not if I know it, you're not, said Carleton grimly. There may be a coroner's inquest before this affair is settled. Perhaps more than one, if things get nasty. But I'm hanged if I propose starting in that way this afternoon. That's all right, Holman replied doggedly. Just the same, I'm... Eh? What's up, Carleton? What's wrong? Spence had bent suddenly over the key, and Carleton, with a startled exclamation, was staring at the words the dispatcher was hastily scribbling on the pad. Holman leaned over the super's shoulder, and even as he saw Carleton reach to plug in the telephone connection with the roundhouse, he read the message. Number two wrecked Eagle Pass. Send wrecker and medical assistance at once. The next instant he was flying across the yard to the shops. As he burst in through the door, he was greeted with a snarl. The men were massed in a body around one of the locomotives in the fitting shop, and Rafferty, from the cab, was talking in fierce, heated tones. At sight of the master mechanic, he stopped short and, with an oath, leaped from his perch straight for Holman. The crowd divided, making a lane between the two men. Then, with startling suddenness breaking the ominous silence that had fallen, there came three short blasts from the shop whistle, the wrecker's signal. It halted Rafferty when but an arm's length from the locomotive foreman. Then Holman spoke. You hear that, men? Number two has gone to glory up in Eagle Pass. You, Rafferty, get the wrecking crew together. Quick, the rest of you get back to work. You're a liar, Rafferty yelled. A measly, putty face starch shirt liar. You hear it's a plant. You can't work any sharp trick like that on me. There was a low, menacing growl from the men, and they edged in close. But Holman gave them no heed. He took a step nearer Rafferty, looking straight into the other's eyes. Rafferty, he said quietly, You've a wife and kids, haven't you? And you're a railroad man, aren't you? Well, there's wives and kids and mates up there in that wreck. The other affair can wait until we get back. Now will you go? And Rafferty went, at the head of the wreckers, out into the yard where the switching crew was working like beavers making up the relief train. Two passenger coaches to serve as ambulances, behind them a flat, then the wrecking crane, the tool car, and a caboose. As Rafferty was piling his men into the train, Holman raced across the tracks to the station. On the platform, the doctors, hastily summoned, were crowded around Carleton. Holman stopped beside them. "'We're all ready, Carleton,' he announced, then to the others. "'You fellows had better get aboard. We'll be off as soon as we get the track.' "'Spence will have the line clear in a minute,' said Carleton, as the doctors started for the coaches. "'I'm sending a dispatcher up with you. He can tap in on the wires.' How many men did you scrape up? The regular crew. And Rafferty? He's going along. I don't know how you did it, but there's no time for explanations now. But I think, Holman, you'd better leave Rafferty behind. And have the whole crew quit, too? It's no use, Carleton. He's got to go. That's all there is to it. Carleton shook his head doubtfully. I, I don't like the idea of you two getting up there together. There's no need of you going, and you'd better not go. You don't know the man. If you think he'll forget, you're wrong. I do. I told you so before. Anyway, it's too late now. We're off. Here's Spence with the orders. Before Carleton could reply, Holman had grabbed the tissue and was running for the train. As he swung himself into the cab of the engine and handed Hurley, the driver, his orders, Rafferty climbed in from the other side. At sight of Holman, Rafferty hesitated and half turned around in the gangway to go back to the caboose. But Holman reached out and caught his arm. Stay where you are, Rafferty he said quietly, and during the nerve-wracking thirty-mile run to Eagle Pass no other words passed between them. Sometimes in the mad slur of the locomotive as she hit the tangents their bodies touched, that was all. Holman, by virtue of railroad etiquette, had climbed to the fireman's seat, and once or twice he had glanced around at the great bulk of the man behind him, at the grim set features, at the eyes that would not meet his, and wondered at his own temerity in inviting a physical encounter. And what good had it done? Was Carleton right, after all? Perhaps. And yet, behind the stubbornness, the self-will, the purely physical, there must be the other side of the man. If he could only reach, if only touch it. He had touched it, his appeal for the injured. Hurley was eating up the miles as only a man at the throttle of a wrecker with clear rights could do it. A long scream from the whistle that echoed through the mountains above the pounding, deafening rush of the train brought Holman back to his immediate surroundings. 
Another minute, and they had swung around the curve and thundered over the trestle that made the approach to the pass. Half a mile ahead of them up the track they saw the horror. Hurley latched at his throttle and began to check. As the brake shoes bit into the tires, Holman slipped off his seat and faced Rafferty. There was a curious look in the other's eyes, and Holman understood. Understood that here Rafferty was his master, and knew it. So this was the meaning of it. This was how he had touched the other's better nature. Rafferty had cunningly seized the opportunity of placing him at an even greater disadvantage than before. For an instant he hesitated as he bit his lip, then he cancelled the personal equation. "'Go ahead, Rafferty,' he said quietly, answering the unspoken challenge. "'You're better up in this sort of thing than I am. You're in charge.' And Rafferty, without a word, swung himself from the cab. To Holman the first five minutes was unnerving. It was his first bad wreck. Down east it had never been his province to go out with the crew, nor was it here, he reflected grimly, and at that moment was grateful for the veteran Rafferty. It was like some hideous nightmare to him. All along the line of burning wreckage lay the dead, their silence the more awful by contrast with the shrieks and cries of the wounded still imprisoned in the wreck. And then the feeling passed, and he worked, worked like a madman. Once a woman had caught his arm, and sobbing dragged him toward the stateroom end of one of the Pullmans. Through the smoke and scorching heat of the flames he had fought his way in, then back with the child. The woman had thrown her arms hysterically around his neck. It was all a mad, furious turmoil, and he gloried in it. The crunch of the axe through glass and woodwork, the wild rush into the heart of things to stagger back blinded and choked with his helpless burden, the fierce joy, if life still lingered, the tender reverence, if life were gone. Up the track toward the engine there was a crash and a chorus of excited cries. He rushed in that direction. A half dozen of the wrecking crew were grouped around the forward baggage car. As Holman reached them, disheveled, clothes torn and scorched, face blackened with smoke and daubed with blood where glass and splinters had cut him, the men drew back aghast, staring, white-faced. By God! one cried. It's him! Well, of course it's me. Are you crazy? What's the matter with you? The man pointed to the blazing car. Someone said that you was in there and he went in after you before she crumpled up. Who? Holman shouted. Rafferty! Holman made a dash for the car. The men held him back. Don't try it, sir. It's too late to do any good. He shook them off, and with his arms crossed in front of his head to protect his face, he half stumbled, half fell through the opening that had once been a door. The car was half over on its side. The trunks dashed into a heap on top of each other when the car had left the track were all that supported the burning roof timbers. Between the trunks and the edge of the car there was little space with the floor at an angle of forty-five degrees, and along this, head down, Holman crawled blindly. The floor was already beginning to smolder. The metal-bound edges of the trunks blistered his hands as he touched them. His senses reeled, but on and on he crawled, and in his mind, over and over, the one thought, Rafferty, my God, Rafferty! Then his hands touched something soft, and slowly, painfully, inch by inch, he struggled back, dragging Rafferty after him. Somehow he reached the door, then a confused jumble of noises, and nothing more until he returned to consciousness and to the knowledge that he was back in his room at Big Cloud with the almond-eyed factorum in attendance. "'Belly much better. Like a eat?' inquired the individual solicitously. Holman grinned in spite of the pain. "'No,' he answered. Then, as he closed his eyes again, he muttered, "'Tell Carlton I, I was right.' And he was. For two days afterward Rafferty publicly abdicated— he gathered the men in the fitting shop and mounted to the cab of an engine jacked halfway up to the ceiling, as before, only on this occasion it was at noon hour and not in the company's time. His words were few and to the point, delivered with a force and eloquence that was all his own. I said he was a damned pink-faced dude, so I did. Well, I take it back, do you mind? And what's more, I'll flatten the face of any man that says I ever said it. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of On the Iron at Big Cloud》by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two: The Little Super. 
Tommy Regan backed the big compound mogul down past the string of dark green coaches that he had pulled for a hundred and fifty miles, took the table with a slight jolt, and came to a stop in the roundhouse. As he swung himself from the cab, Healy, the turner, came up to him. He's a great lad, that of yours, Healy began, with a shake of his head. A great lad, but mind you this, Tommy Regan, there'll be trouble for me and you and him and the whole of us if you don't watch him. "'What's the matter this time, John?' "'Matter,' said Healy, ruefully. "'There's matter enough. "'The little cuss come blame near running 429 into the pit a while back, so he did.' Well, "'Where is he now?' Regan asked with a grin. "'Divil a bit, I know. "'I chased him out, and he started for over by the shops. "'And about an hour ago your missus come down and said the boy was nowhere to be found, "'and that you was to look for him.' Regan pulled out his watch. Six thirty. well, he said. I'll go over and see if Grumpy knows anything about him. Next time the kid shows up around here, John, you give him the soft side of a tommy bar and send him home. Healy scratched his head. I will, he said. I'll do it. He's a fine lad. Regan crossed the yard to the gates of the big shops. They were still unlocked, and he went through into the storekeeper's office. Grumpy was sorting the brass time checks. He glanced up as Regan came in. "'I suppose you're looking for your kid again,' he said sourly. "'That's what I am, Steve,' Regan returned, diplomatically dispensing with the other's nickname. "'Well, he ain't here,' Grumpy announced, returning to his checks. "'I've just been through the shops, and I'd seen him if he was.' The engineer's face clouded. Oh, "'He must be somewhere about, Steve. John said he saw him come over here.' and the wife was down to the roundhouse looking for him, so he didn't go home. So let's go through the shops and see if we can't find him. I don't get no overtime for chasing lost kids, growled Grumpy. Nevertheless, he got up and walked through the door leading into the forge shop, which Regan held open for him. The place was gloomy and deserted. Here and there a forge fire, dying, still glowed dully, at the end of the room the men stopped, and Grumpy, noting Regan's growing anxiety, gave surly comfort. "'Wouldn't likely be in here anyhow,' he said. "'Fitting shop for him. But we'll try the machine shop first on the way through.' The two men went forward, prying behind planers, drills, shapers, and lathes. The machines took grotesque shapes in the deepening twilight, and in the silence, so in Congress with the usual noisy clang and clash of the surroundings, Regan's nervousness increased. He hurried forward to the fitting shop. Engines on every hand were standing over their respective pits in all stages of demolition, some on wheels, some blocked high toward the rafters, some stripped to the bare boiler shell. Regan climbed in and out of the cabs while Grumpy peered into the pits. "'Ah, he ain't here,' said Grumpy in disgust, wiping his hands on a piece of waste. "'I told you he wasn't. He's home maybe by now.' Regan shook his head. Bunty, ho, oh, Bunty, he called, and again, Bunty. There was no answer, and he turned to retrace his steps when Grumpy caught him by the shoulder. The big iron door of the engine before them swung slowly back on its hinges, and from the front end there emerged a diminutive pair of shoes, topped by little short socks that had once been white, but now hung in grimy folds over the tops of the boots. A pair of sturdy but very dirty bare legs came gradually into view as their owner propelled himself forward on his stomach. They dangled for a moment, seeking footing on the plate beneath them, then a very small boy, aged four, in an erstwhile immaculate linen sailor suit, stood upright on the footplate. The yellow curls were tangled with engine grease and cemented with cinders and soot. Here and there, in spots upon his face, the skin still retained its natural color. Bunty paused for a moment after his exertions to regain his breath, then still gripping a hammer in his small fist, he straddled the drawbar and slid down the pilot to the floor. Grumpy burst into a guffaw. Bunty blinked at him reprovingly and turned to his father. I've been fixing the aggerade, he announced gravely. Regan surveyed his son grimly. Fixin' what? he demanded. The aggerade, Bunty repeated, then reproachfully. Don't you know what Igorhead is? Oh, said Regan. The niggerhead, eh? Well, I guess there's another niggerhead will get some fixin' when your mother sees your son. 
He picked the lad up in his arms, and Bunty nestled confidingly with one arm around his father's neck. His tired little head sank down on the paternal shoulder, and before they had reached the gates, Bunty was sound asleep. In the days that followed, Bunty found it no easy matter to elude his mother's vigilance, but that was only the beginning of his troubles. The shop gates were always shut, and the latch was beyond his reach. Once he had found them open and had marched boldly through, to find his way barred by the only man of whom he stood in awe. Grumpy had curtly ordered him away, and Bunty had taken to his heels and run until his small body was breathless. The roundhouse was no better. Old John would have none of him, and Bunty marveled at the change. He was a railroad man, and the shops were his heritage. His soul protested vigorously at the outrage that was being heaped upon him. It took him some time to solve the problem, but at last he found the way. Each afternoon Bunty would trudge sturdily along the track for a quarter of a mile to the upper end of the shops, where the big wide engine doors were always open. Here four spur tracks ran into the erecting shop, and Bunty found no difficulty in gaining admittance. Once safe among the fitting gang, the little super, as the men called him, would strut around with important air, inspecting the work with critical eyes. One lesson Bunty learned. Remembering his last interview with his mother, he took good care not to be locked in the shops again. So each night, when the whistle blew, he fell into line with the men, and, secure in their protection, would file with them past Grumpy as they handed in their time checks and Grumpy, unmindful of the spur tracks, wondered how he got there, and scowled savagely. When Bunty was six, his father was holding down the swivel chair in the master mechanic's office of the Hill Division, and Bunty's allegiance to the shops wavered. Not from any sense of disloyalty, but with his father's promotion a new world opened to Bunty and fascinated him. It was now the yard shunter and headquarters that engaged his attention. The years, too, brought other changes to Bunty. The curls had disappeared, and his hair was cut now like his father's. Long stockings had replaced the socks, and he wore real trousers. Short ones, it is true, but real trousers nonetheless, with pockets in them. When school was over, he would fly up and down the yard on the stubby little engine, and Healy, doing the shunting then and forgetting past grievances, would let Bunty sit on the driver's seat. In time Bunty learned to pull the throttle, but the reversing lever was too much for his small stature, and the intricacies of the air were still a little beyond him. But Healy swore he'd make a driver of him, and he did. The evenings at the office Bunty loved fully as well. Headquarters were not much to boast about in those days. That was before competition forced a double-track system, and the train dispatcher with his tissue sheet still held undisputed sway. They called them offices at Big Cloud out of courtesy, just the attic floor over the station with one room to it. The floor space each man's desk occupied was his office. Here Bunty would sit curled up in his father's chair and listen to the men as they talked. If it was anything about a locomotive, he understood. If it was traffic or bridges or roadbed or dispatching, he would pucker his brows perplexedly and ask innumerable questions. But most of all he held Spence, the chief dispatcher, in deep reverence. Once, to his huge delight, Spence, holding his hand, had let him tap out an order. It is true that with the OK came back an inquiry as to the brand the dispatcher had been indulging in, but the sarcasm was lost on Bunty, for when Spence, with a chuckle, read off the reply, Bunty gravely asked if there was any answer. Spence shook his head and laughed. No, son, I guess not he said. We've got to maintain our dignity, you know. That winter, on top of the regular traffic, and that was not light, they began to push supplies from the east over the hill division, preparing to double-track the road from the western side of the foothills as soon as spring opened up. And while the thermometer crept steadily to zero, the hill division sweltered. Everybody and everything got it, the shops and the roadbeds, the train crews and the rolling stock, what little sleep Carlton the super got he spent in formulating dream plans to handle the business. Those that seemed good to him when he awoke were promptly vetoed by the barons of the general office in the far-off east. Regan got no sleep. He raced from one end of the division to the other, and he did his best. 
engine crews had to tinker anything less than a major injury for themselves. There was no room in the shops for them. But the men on the keys got it most of all. As the days wore into months, Spence's face grew careworn and haggard, and the irritability from overwork of the men about him added to his discomfort. Human nature needs a safety valve, and one night near the end of January, when Regan and Carleton and Spence were gathered at the office, with Bunty in his accustomed place in his father's chair, the master mechanic cut loose. "'It's up to you, Spence,' he cried savagely, bringing his fist down with a crash on the desk. "'There ain't a pair of wheels on the division fit to pull a handcar. Every engine's a cripple, and getting lamer every day. The engine ain't built, nor never will be, that'll stand the schedule you're putting them on through the hills, especially through the gap. There's a three per cent with the bed like an S. You can't make time there, you've got to crawl. You're pulling the stay bolts out of me engines, that's what you're doing.' Carleton, being in no angelic mood and glad to vent his feelings, growled assent. Spence raised his hand from the keys, a red tinge of resentment on his cheeks. He picked up his pipe, packing it slowly as he looked at Regan and the super. "'I'm taking all they're sending,' he said quietly. He reached over for the train sheet and handed it to the super. "'You and Regan here are growling about the schedule. It's your division, Carlton, but I'm not sure you know just what we're handling every twenty-four hours. It's pushed them through on top of each other somehow.' or tell them down east we can't handle them. Do you want to do that? No, said Carleton. I don't, and what's more, I won't. Spence nodded. I rather figured that was your idea. Well, we've about all we can do without nagging one another. I'm near in now, and so are you and Regan here, both of you. I've got to make time, gap or no gap. There's so much moving there isn't siding enough to cross them. You're right, said Carleton. We can't afford to jump each other. We're all doing our best, and each of us knows it. I was number one and two tonight. Spence studied for a moment before he answered. Number one is forty minutes off, and number two's an hour to the bad. Carleton groaned. The Imperial Limited, West and East, officially known on the train sheets as one and two, carried both the transcontinental mail and the deluxe passengers. Of late, the East had been making pertinent suggestions to the division superintendent that it would be as well if those trains ran off the Hill Division with a little more regard for their established schedule. So Carleton groaned. He got up and put on his hat and coat preparatory to going home. "'Look here,' he said from the doorway. "'They'll stand for most anything if we don't misuse one and two. They're getting mighty savage about that, and they'll drop hard before long. You fellas have got to take care of those trains if nothing else on the division moves. That's orders. I'll shoulder all kicks coming on the rest of the traffic. Good night. When Bunty left the office that night and walked home with his father, he had learned that there was another side to railroading besides the building and repairing of engines— and the delivery of magic tissue sheets to train crews that told them when and where to stop and how to thread their way through hills and plains on a single-track road with heaps of other trains, some going one way, some another. He understood vaguely and in a hazy kind of way that somewhere, many, many miles away, there were men who sat in judgment on the doings of his father and Spence and Carleton, that these men were to be obeyed, that their word was law, and that their names were president and directors. So Bunty, trotting beside his father, pondered these things. Being too weighty for him, he appealed, Daddy, what's president and directors? Regan's temper still being ruffled, he answered shortly, Fools, mostly. Bunty nodded gravely, and his education as a railroad man was almost complete. The rest came quickly, and the gap did it. The gap. There was not a man on the division from track walker to superintendent who would not jump like a nervous colt if you said gap to them offhand and short like. A peaceful stretch of track it looked, a little crooked, as Regan said, hugging the side of the mountain at the highest point of the division. The surroundings were undeniably grand. 
a sheer drop of eighteen hundred feet to the canyon below with the surrounding mountains rearing their snow-capped peaks skyward completed a picture of which the road had electrotypes and which it used in their magazine advertising what the picture did not show was the two-mile drop where the roadbed took a straight three per cent and sometimes better to the lower levels so when carleton or spence or regan reading their magazine saw the picture they shuddered and remembering past history and fearful of the future turned the page hurriedly but to bunty the gap possessed the fascination of the unknown he was wakened early the next morning by his father's voice talking excitedly over the special wire with headquarters about the gap and a wreck he sat bolt upright and listened with all his might then he crawled noiselessly out of bed and began to dress hastily he heard his father speaking to his mother and presently the front door banged bunty was dressed by that time and he crept downstairs and opened the door softly it was just turning daylight as he started on a run for the yard it was not far to the office a hundred yards or so and bunty reached there in record time across the tracks by the roundhouse they were coupling on to the wrecker and answering hasty summons men running from all directions were quickly gathering bunty hesitated a minute on the platform then he entered the station and tiptoed softly up the stairs the office door was open and from the top stair bunty could see into the room the night lamp was still burning on the dispatcher's desk and spence was sitting there working with frantic haste to clear the line in the center of the room the super his father and flannagan the wrecking boss were standing it's a freight smash carleton was saying to flannagan east edge of the gap you'll have the rights through and no limit on your permit tell emmons if he doesn't make it better than ninety minutes he'll talk to me afterward by the time you get there number two will be crawling up the grade she's pulling the old man's car and that means get her through somehow if you have to drop the wreck over the cliff you can back down to riley's to let her pass we'll do the patching up afterward understand flannagan nodded and glanced impatiently at spence the super opened and shut his watch ready spence he asked shortly just minute spence answered quietly bunty waited to hear no more he turned and ran down the stairs and across the tracks as fast as his legs would carry him he scrambled breathlessly up the steps of the tool car and edged his way in among the men grouped near the door he was fairly inside before they noticed him hello cried allen bunty's bosom friend of the fitting gang days here's the little super what you doing here kid i'm going up to the wreck bunty announced sturdily the men laughed well i guess not much you're not said allen what do you think your father would say nothing said bunty airily i just come from the office he added artfully and i'll tell you about the wreck if you like the men grouped around him in a circle it's at the gap bunty began sparring for time as through the window he saw flannagan coming from the office at a run and it's a freight train and, and it's all smashed up and the train started with a jerk that nearly took the men off their feet at the same time flannagan's face appeared at the car door i'll hear boys he called then he announced cheerfully the devil's to pay up the line meanwhile bunty taking advantage of the interruption had squirmed his way through the men to the far end of the car and the train had bumped over the switches onto the main line before they remembered him then it was too late they hauled him out from behind a rampart of tools where he had entrenched himself and flannagan shook his fist half angrily half playfully in bunty's face you little devil what are you doing here eh he demanded and bunty answered as before i'm going up to the wreck hm, said flannagan with a grin well i guess you are and i guess you'll be sorry too when you get back and your dad gets hold of you but bunty was safe now and he only laughed breakfastless he shared the men's grub and listened wide-eyed as they talked of wrecks in time gone by but most of all he listened to the story of how his father when he was pulling number one had saved the limited by sticking to his post almost in the face of certain death bunty's father was his hero and his small soul glowed with happiness at the tale he begged so hard for the story over again that allen told it and when he had finished he slapped bunty on the back and i guess you're a chip off the old block he said and bunty was very proud squaring his shoulders and planting his feet firmly to swing with the motion of the car 
The speed of the train slackened as they struck the grade leading up the eastern side of the gap. Flanagan set the men busily at work overhauling the kit. He paused an instant before Bunty. "'Look here, kid,' he said, shaking a warning finger. "'You keep out of the way and don't get into trouble.' It would have taken more than words from Flanagan to have curbed Bunty's eagerness, so when the train came to a stop and the men tumbled out of the car with a rush, he followed. What he saw caused him to purse his lips and cry excitedly, "'Gee!' Right in front of him a big mogul had turned turtle. Ditched by a spread rail, she had pulled three boxcars with her and piled them up, mostly in splinters, on the tender. They had taken fire and were burning furiously. Behind these were eight or ten cars still on the roadbed, but badly demolished from bumping over the ties when they had left the rails. Still farther down the track in the rear were the rest of the string, apparently uninjured. The snow was knee-deep at the side of the track, but Bunty ploughed manfully through it, climbing up the embankment to a place of vantage. His eyes blazed with excitement as he watched the scene before him and listened to the hoarse shouts of the men, the crash of the pickaxe, and above all, the sharp crackle of the fire as the flames, growing in volume, bit deeper and deeper into the wreck. Fiercely as the men fought, the fire with its long start kept them from making any headway against it. Already it had reached some of the cars standing on the track. From where Bunty stood he could see the track dipping away in a long grade to the valley below. They called that grade the Devil's Slide, and the wreck was on the edge of it, with the caboose and some half-dozen cars still resting on the incline. As he looked, far below him he saw a trail of smoke. It was number two climbing the grade. By this time the excitement of his surroundings had worn off a little, and the arrival of the Limited offered a new attraction. He clambered down from his perch and began to pick his way past the wreck. Flanagan, begrimed and dirty, was talking to Emmons. "'I don't like to do it,' Bunty heard Flanagan say. "'But we'll have to blow up that box-car if we can't stop the fire any other way, or we'll have a blaze down the whole line. The train crew says there's turpentine, two cars of it next the flat there, and if that catches—' "'Hey, there, kid!' he broke off to yell as he caught sight of Bunty. "'You'll get back to the tool-car and stay there!' And Bunty ran, in the other direction. He knew number two would stop a little, the other side of the wreck, and that there would be a great big ten-wheeler pulling her, all as bright as a new dollar and glistening in paint and gold leaf. When he pulled up breathless and happy by the side of number two, Masters, the engineer, was giving engine 901 an oil round, touching the journals critically with the back of his hand as he moved along. At sight of Bunty, the engineer laid his oil can on the slide bars and grinned as he extended his hand. "'How are you, Bunty?' he asked and Bunty, accepting the proffered hand, replied gravely, "'I'm pretty well, Mr. Masters, thank you.' "'Glad to hear it, Bunty. H how did you get here?' "'I comed up with the record train. It's an awful smash.' "'Is it now? Think they'll have the line cleared soon?' "'Oh, no,' Bunty replied, eyeing the cab of the big engine wistfully. "'Not for ever and ever so long.' Masters' eyes followed Bunty's glance. "'Want to get up in the cab, Bunty?' "'Oh, please!' Bunty cried breathlessly. "'All right,' said Masters, boosting the lad through the gangway. Then warningly, "'Don't touch anything!' And Bunty promised. It was only four hundred yards up to the wreck, but that was enough. Masters and his firemen left their train and went to get a view at close quarters. When it was all over, it was up to the wrecking boss and the engine crew of number two. Flanagan swore he blocked the trucks of the cars on the incline, but Flanagan lied, and he got clear. Masters and his mate had no chance to lie, for they broke rules, and they got their time. Be that as it may, Bunty sat on the driver's seat of the Imperial Limited and watched the engineer and fireman start up the track. He lost sight of the men long before they reached the wreck. They were still in view, but he was very busy. He was playing pretend. Bunty's imagination was vivid enough to make the game a fascinating one whenever he indulged in it, and that was often. But now it was almost reality, and his fancy was little taxed to supply what was lacking. He was engineer of the Limited, and they had just stopped at a station. He leaned out of the cab window to get the go-ahead signal. Then his hand went through the motion of throwing over the reversing lever and opening the throttle. And now he was off, faster and faster. He rocked his body to and fro to supply the motion of the cab. 
He sat very grim and determined, peering straight ahead. He was booming along now at full speed. They were coming to a crossing. Toot, 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 cried Bunty at the top of his shrill treble, for the rules said you must whistle at every crossing, and Bunty knew the rules. Now they were coming to the next station, and he began to slow up. Ding, dong, ding, bang! Bunty nearly fell from his seat with fright. Ahead of him, up the track, there was a column of smoke as a mass of wreckage rose in the air, and then a crash. Flanagan had blown up a car. Bunty stared, fascinated not at the explosion, but at the rear end of the wreck on the grade. He rubbed his eyes in bewilderment. Then he scrambled over the side of the seat. He paused halfway off, looking again through the front window to make sure. There was no doubt of it. The cars were beginning to roll down the track toward him. He waited for no more, but rushed to the gangway to jump off. Then he stopped as the story Alan had told about his father came back to him. Bunty's heart thumped wildly as he turned white-faced and determined. No truly engineer would leave his train. His father had not, and Bunty did not. The reversing lever was in the back notch where Masters had left it when he stopped the train. It was Bunty's task to reach and open the throttle. He climbed up on the seat and stood on tiptoe. Leaning over, he grasped the lever with both hands and pulled it open. What little science of engine driving Bunty possessed was lost in the terror that gripped him. The runaway cars were only a couple of hundred yards away now, and gaining speed with every rail they traveled, spelt death and destruction to the Imperial Limited if they ever reached her. The men at the top of the grade were yelling their lungs out and waving their arms in frantic warning. The train started with a jolt that threw Bunty back on the seat. For an instant the big drivers raced like pinwheels, then they bit into the rails, and aided by the grade, number two began to back slowly down the hill. Bunty picked himself up, his little frame shaking with dry sobs. The freight cars had gained on him in the last minute and had nearly reached him. Again he leaned over for the throttle, and hanging grimly to it, pulled it open another notch, and then another, and then wide open. 901 took it like a frightened thoroughbred. Rearing herself from the track under her 210 pounds of steam, she jumped into the cars behind her for a starter with a shock that played havoc with the passenger's nerves. Then she settled down to travel. The devil's slide is two miles long, and some pretty fair running has been made on it in times of stress. But Bunty holds the record. It's good yet. And Bunty was only an amateur. It was neck and neck for a while, and there was almost a pile-up on the nose of 901's pilot before she began to hold her own. Gradually she began to pull away, and by the time they were halfway down the hill the distance between her and the truant freight cars was widening. The speed was terrific. Pale and terror-stricken, Bunty now crouched on the driver's seat. Time and again the engineer's whistle in the cab over his head signaled, now entreatingly, now with frantic insistence. But Bunty gave it no heed. His only thought was for those cars in front of him that were always there. He cried to himself with little moans. There was a sickening slur as they flew around a curve. 901 heeled to the tangent, one set of drivers fairly lifted from the track. When she found her wheelbase again, Bunty, shaken from his hold, was clinging to the reversing lever. He shut his eyes as he pulled himself back to his seat. When he looked again, he saw the freight cars hit the curve above him, then slew as they jumped the track, and with a crash that reached him above the roar and rattle of the train, the booming whir of the great drivers beneath him go pitching headlong down the embankment. Bunty rose to his knees, and for the first time looked out of the side window, to find a new terror there as the rocks and trees and poles flashed dizzily by him. He turned and looked behind. A man was clinging to the handrail of the mail car, and another lying flat was crawling over the coal heaped high on the tender. Bunty dashed the tears from his eyes. He was no freighty kid. He stood up and, holding on to the frame of the window, staggered toward the throttle. As he reached for it, 901 lurched madly, and Bunty lost his balance and fell headlong upon the iron floor plate of the cab. Then it was all dark. Number two pulled into Big Cloud that night, ten hours late, and it brought Bunty. His father and Carlton and Spence and the shop hands were on the platform. From the private car which carried the tail lights, an elderly gentleman got off with Bunty in his arms. The men cheered, and while the master mechanic rushed forward to take his son, the super and Spence drew back respectfully. 
Mr. Regan, said the old gentleman, with tears in his eyes, you ought to be very proud of this little lad. Regan tried to speak, but the words choked somehow. The old gentleman swung himself back up on the car. Goodbye, Bunty, he called. And Bunty, from the depths of the blanket they had wrapped around him, called back, Goodbye, sir. When Bunty was propped up in bed, his father told him how the express messenger had stopped the train and carried him back into the Pullmans. Bunty listened gravely. Yes, he said, nodding his head. They was awful good to me, and the man that took me off the train told me stories, and then I told him some, too. What did you tell him? Regan asked. Oh, about trains and shops and presidents and directors and lots of things. Presidents and directors, said Regan in surprise. What did you tell him about them? I told him what you said, that they was fools, and you knew cause you'd seen them. Regan whistled softly. And, continued Bunty, he laughed, and when I asked him what he was laughing at, he gave me a piece of paper and told me to give it to you, and you'd tell me. Regan groaned. Guess it's my time, all right, he muttered. Where's the paper, Bunty? He put it in my pocket. Regan drew the chair with Bunty's clothing on it toward him and began a hurried search. He fished out a narrow slip of paper and unfolded it on his knee. It was a check for one thousand dollars payable to Master Bunty Regan and signed by the President of the Road. End of Chapter 2 The Little Super Chapter 3 of On the Iron at Big Cloud by Frank L. Packard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 3 If a Man Die. East and West now the transcontinental is double tracked, all except the Hill Division, and that in the nature of things probably never will be. If you know the mountains, you know the Hill Division. From the divisional point, Big Cloud, that snuggles in the eastern foothills, the right-of-way, like the trail of a great sinewy serpent, twists and turns through the mountains, through the Rockies, through the Sierras, and finally emerges to link its steel with a sister division that stretches onward to the great blue of the Pacific Ocean. It is a stupendous piece of track. It has cost fabulous sums and the lives of many men. It has made the fame of some and been the graveyard of more. The history of the world in big things, in little things, in battles, in strife, in sudden death, in peace, in progress, and in achievement has its counterpart in miniature, in the history of the Hill Division. There is a page in that history that belongs to Angel Breen. This is Breen's story. It has been written much and said oftener that men in every walk of life, save one, may make mistakes and live them down, but that the dispatcher who falls once is damned forever. And it is true. I am a dispatcher, I know. Where he got the nickname Angel from is more than I can tell you, and I've wondered at it often enough myself. Contrast, I guess it was. Contrast with the boisterous, rough, and ready men around him, for this happened back in the early days, when men were... What a life of hardship and no comfort made them. No, Breen wasn't soft, far from it. He was just quiet and mild-mannered. It must have been that contrast. Anyway, he was Angel when I first knew him. And you can draw your own conclusions as to what he is now. I'm not saying anything at all about that. Where did he come from? What was he before he came here? I don't know. I don't believe anybody knew or ever gave the matter a thought. That sort of question was never asked. It was too delicate and pointed in the majority of cases. A man was what he was out here, not what he had been. He made good, or he didn't. Not that I mean to imply that there was anything crooked or anything wrong with Breen's past. I'm sure there wasn't, for that matter. But I'm just trying to make you understand that when I say Breen had the night trick in the dispatcher's office here in Big Cloud, I'm beginning at the beginning. Breen wasn't popular. He wasn't a good enough mixer for that. Personally, it isn't anything I'd hold up against him or any other man. 
popularity is too often cheap and being a good fellow isn't always a license for a man to puff out his chest though most of them do it and that's the high sign that what i say is right no i'm not moralizing i'm telling a story you'll see what i mean before i get through i say breen wasn't popular he got the reputation of thinking himself a little above the rank and file of those around him stuck up to put it in cold english and that's where they did him an injustice it was the man's nature unobtrusive retiring different from theirs if you get my point and they couldn't understand just because it was different the limitations weren't all up to breen if they had known or taken the trouble to know as much about him as they could have known before passing judgment on him perhaps things might have been a little different perhaps not I won't say, for it's pretty generally accepted in railroad law that a dispatcher's slip is a capital offense, and there's no court of appeal, no stay of execution, no anything, and to all intents and purposes he's dead from the moment that slip is made. There have been lots of cases like that, lots of them, and there's no class of men I pity more. A slip, and damned for the rest of their lives. I don't say that because I'm a dispatcher myself. We're only human, aren't we? Mistakes like that, God knows, aren't made intentionally. Sometimes a man is overworked. Sometimes queer brain kinks happen to him just as they do to every other man. We're ranked as human in everything but our work. I'm not saying it's not right. In the last analysis, I suppose it has to be that way. It's part of the game, and we know the rules when we sit in. We've no reason to complain. Only I get a shiver every time I read a newspaper headline that I know, besides being a death warrant, is tearing the heart out of some poor devil. You've seen the kind, I mean. Read scores of them. Dispatcher's blunder cost many lives. Or something to the same effect. Maybe you'll think it queer, but for days afterward I can't handle an order book or a train sheet when I'm on duty without my heart being in my mouth half the time. What's this got to do with Breen? Well, in one way, it hasn't anything to do with him. And then again, in another way, it has. I want you to know that a blunder means something to a dispatcher besides the loss of his job. Do you think they're a cold-blooded, calloused lot? I want you to know that they care. Oh, yes, they're human. They've got a heart, and they've got a soul. The one to break, the other to sear. My God! God, think of it, a slip. That's the ghastly horror of it all, a slip. Don't you think they can feel? Don't you think their own agony of mind is punishment enough without the added reproach and worse of their fellows? But let it go. It's the law of the game. I said they didn't know much about Breen out here then, except that he was a pretty good dispatcher. But as far as that goes, it didn't help him any, rather the reverse when the smash came. The better the man, the harder the fall, what? It's generally that way, isn't it? Perhaps you're wondering what I know about him. I'll tell you. If anyone knew Breen, I knew him. I was only a kid then. I'm a man now. I hadn't even a coat. Breen gave me one. I'm a dispatcher. Breen taught me, and no better man on the key than Breen ever lived, a better man than I could ever hope to be. Yet he slipped. Do you wonder I shiver when I read those things? I'm not a religious man, but I've asked God on my bended knees over and over again to keep me from the horror, the suffering, the blasted life that came to Breen and many another man through a slip. Yes, if anyone knew Breen, I did. All I know, all I've got, everything in this whole wide world I owe to Breen, <laughs> Angel Breen. You probably read of the Oaktail wreck at the time it happened, but you've forgotten about it by now. Those things don't live long in the mind unless they come pretty close to home to you. There's too many other things happening every hour in this big pulsing world to make it anything more than the sensation of the moment. But out here the details have cause enough to be fixed in the minds of most of us, not only of the wreck itself, but of what happened afterwards as well. And I don't know which of the two was the worse. You can judge for yourself. I'm not going into technicalities. You'll understand better if I don't. 
You'll remember I said that the Hill Division is only single-tracked. That means, I don't need to tell you, that it's up to the dispatcher every second, and all that stands between the trains and eternity is the bit of tissue tucked in the engineer's blouse and its duplicate crammed in the conductor's side pocket. Orders. Meeting points. Single track, you understand. The dispatcher holds them all, every last one of them, for life or death, men, women and children, train crews and company property, all. And Breen slipped. No one knows to this day how it happened. I dare say some eminent authority on psychology might explain it, but the explanation would be too high-browed and too far over my head to understand it even if he did. I only know the facts and the result. Breen sent out a lap order on number 1, the Imperial Limited, westbound, and number 82, a fast freight, perishable, streaking east. Both were off schedule, and he was nursing them along for every second he could squeeze. Back through the mountains, both ways, all through the night, he'd given them the best of everything. The Imperial, clear rights, the 82, pretty nearly, if not quite, as good. Then he fixed the meeting point for the two trains. I read a story once where the dispatcher sent out a lap order on two trains, and his mistake was staring at him all the time from his order book. I guess that was a slip of the pen, and he never noticed it. That was queer enough. But what Breen did was queerer still. His order book showed straight as a string. The freight was to hold at Muddy Lake, ten miles west of Elktail, for number one. Number one, of course, as I told you, running free. Somehow, I don't know how, it's one of those things you can't explain, a subconscious break between the mind and the mechanical, physical action. You've noticed it in little things you've done yourself. Breen wired the word Elktail instead of Muddy Lake, and never knew it never had a hint that anything was wrong, never caught it on the repeat and gave back his okay. The order, the written order in the book, was exactly as it should be. It read Muddy Lake. That was right, Muddy Lake. Yet see what happened? There wasn't time for the freight to make Elk Tail, but she got within three miles of it, and that's as far as she ever got. In a nasty piece of track full of trestles and gorges, where the right-of-way bends worse than the letter S, they met, the two of them, head-on, number one and number eighty-two. And Breen didn't know what he had done, even after the details began to pour in. How could he know? What was eighty-two doing east of Muddy Lake? She should have been waiting there for number one to pass her. The order book showed that plain enough and all through the rest of that night while he worked like a madman clearing the line getting up hospital relief and wrecking trains with carleton he was super then gray-faced and haggard like the master of a storm-tossed liner on his bridge giving orders pacing the room cursing at times at his own impotency breen didn't know neither of them knew where the blame lay but the horror of the thing had breen in its grip even then i was there that night and I can see him now, bent over under the green-shaded lamp. I can see Carleton's face, and it wasn't a pleasant face to see. One thing I remember Breen said. Once, as the sounder piteously clicked a message more ghastly than any that had gone before, adding to the number of those whose lives had gone out forever, adding to the tale of the wounded, to the wild, mad story of chaos and ruin, Breen lifted his head from the key for a moment, pushed his hair out of his eyes with a nervous, shaky sweep of his hand, and looked at Carleton. "'It's horrible, horrible,' he whispered. "'But think of the man who did it. Death would be easy compared to what he must feel. It makes me as weak as a kitten to think of it, Carleton. My God, man, don't you see? I or any other dispatcher might do the same thing tomorrow, the next day or the day after.' Tell me again, Carleton, tell me again that order's straight. Don't lose your nerve, Carleton answered sharply. Whoever has blundered, it's not you. Irony? No. It's beyond all that, isn't it? It's getting about as near to the tragedy of a man's life as you can get. It's getting as deep and tapping as near bedrock as we'll ever do this side of the Great Divide. Think of it. Think of Breen that night. It's too big to get, isn't it? God pity him. Those words of his have hung in my ears all those years, and that scene I can see over again in every detail every time I close my eyes. 
In the few hours left before dawn that morning there wasn't time to give much attention to the cause. There was enough else to think of, enough to give every last man on the division from car tink to superintendent all and more than they could handle. The investigation would come later. But it never came. There was no need for one. How did they find out? It came like the crack of doom, and Breen got it, got it and it seemed to burst the floodgates of his memory open, seemed to touch that dormant cord, and he knew, knew as he knew that he had a god, what he had done. They found the order that made the meeting point Elktail tucked in Mooney's jumper when, after they got the crane at work, they hauled him out from under his engine. Who was Mooney? Engineer of the freight. They found him before they did any of his train crew, or his firemen either, for that matter. Dead? Yes. I'm a dispatcher. Look at it from the other side if you want to. It's only fair. That bit of tissue cleared Mooney, of course, but it sent him to his death. Yes, I know. Good God, don't you think I know what it means to slip? It was just before Davis, Breen's relief, came on for the morning trick. In fact, Davis was in the room when Breen got the report. He scribbled it on a pad, word by word, as it came in for Carlton to see. For a minute it didn't seem to mean anything to him, and then, as I say, he got it. I never saw such a look on a man's face before, and I pray God I never may again. He seemed to wither up, blasted as the oak is blasted by a lightning stroke. The horror, the despair, the agony in his eyes are beyond any words of mine to describe, and you wouldn't want to hear it if I could tell you. He held out his arms pitifully like a pleading child. His lips moved, but he had to try over and over again before any sound came from them. There was no thought of throwing the blame on anybody else. Breen wasn't that kind. Oh, yes, he could have done it. He could have put the blunder on the night man at the gap where Mooney received his elk tail holding order, and Breen's order book would have left it an open question as to which of the two had made the mistake would probably have let him out and damned the other. You say, from the way he acted, he didn't think of that, and therefore the temptation didn't come to him. Yes, I, I, I know what you mean. Not so much to Breen's credit, what? Well, I don't know. It depends on the way you look at it. I'd rather believe the thought didn't come because the man's soul was too clean. He was clean then, no matter what he did afterward. There have been death scenes of dispatchers before, many of them. There will be others in the days to come, many of them. So long as there are railroads and so long as men are frail as men, lacking the infallibility of a higher power, just so long will they be inevitable. But no death scene of a dispatcher's career was ever as this one was. Breen was his own judge, his own jury, his own executioner. Do you think I can ever forget his words? He pointed his hand toward the window that faced the western stretch of track, toward the foothills, toward the mighty peaks of the Rockies that towered beyond them, and the life, the, the being of the man was in his voice. They came slowly, those words, wrenched from a broken heart, torn from a shuddering soul. I wish to God that it were me in their stead. Christ be merciful. I did it, Carlton. I don't know how. I did it. No one answered him. No one spoke. For a moment, that seemed like all eternity, there was silence. Then Breen, his arm still held out before him, walked across the room as a blind man walks in his own utter darkness, walked to the door and passed out, alone. Those few steps across the room, alone. I've thought of that pretty often since. They seem so horribly, grimly significant in keeping with what there was of life left for the stricken man, alone. It's a pretty hard word, that, sometimes, and sometimes it brings the tears. I don't know how I let him go like that. I was too stunned to move, I guess, but I reached out at the foot of the stairs as he stepped out onto the platform. There wasn't anything I could say, was there? What would you have said? No man knew better than Breen himself what this would mean to him. He was wrecked, wrecked worse than that other wreck, for his was a living death. 
There weren't any grand juries or things of that kind out here then, not that it would have made any difference to Breen if there had been. You can't put any more water in a pail when it's already full, can you? You can't add to the maximum, can you? Don't you think Breen's punishment was beyond the reach of man or men to add to, or for that matter, to abate by so much as the smallest fraction? It was, God knows it was, all except one final twinge that I believe now settled him, though I'll say here that whatever it did to Breen, it's not for me to judge her. Who am I that I should? It's between her and her maker. I'll come to that in a minute. Yes, Breen knew well enough what it meant to him, but his thoughts that morning as we walked up the street weren't, I know right well, on himself. He was thinking of those others. And I, well, I was thinking of Breen. Wouldn't you? I told you I owed Breen everything I had in the world. Neither of us said a word all the way up to his boarding house. It was almost as though I wasn't with him for all the attention he paid to me. But he knew I was there just the same. I liked to think of that. I wasn't very old then. I'm not offering that as an excuse, for I'm not ashamed to admit I was near to tears. If I'd been older, perhaps I could have said or done something to help. As it was, all I could do was to turn that one black thought over and over and over again in my mind. Breen's living death, 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 death. That's the way it hit me, the way it caught me, and the word clung and repeated itself as I kept step beside him. He was dead. Dead to hope, ambition, future, everything. As dead as though he lay outstretched before me in his coffin. It seemed as if I could see him that way. And then, don't ask me why, I don't know. I only know such things happen, come upon you unconsciously, suddenly, there flashed into my mind that bit of verse from the Bible. You know it. If a man die, shall he live again? I must have said it out loud without knowing it, for he whirled upon me quick as lightning, placed his two hands upon my shoulders, and stared with a startled gaze into my eyes. I say startled. It was, but there was more. There seemed for a second a gleam of hope, awakened, hungry. Oh, how hungry! Pitiful in its yearning. And, and then the uselessness, the futility of that hope crushed it back, stamped it out, and the light in his eyes grew dull and died away. We had halted at the door of his boarding house, and I made as though to go upstairs with him to his room, but he stopped me. Not now, Charlie boy, he said, shaking his head and trying to smile. Not now. I want to be alone. And so I left him. Alone. He wanted to be alone were ever words more full of cruel mockery. It seems hard to understand sometimes, doesn't it? And we get to questioning things we'd far better leave alone. I know at first I used to wonder why Almighty God ever let Breen make that slip. He could have stopped it, couldn't he? But that's not right. We're running on train orders from the great dispatcher, and the finite can't span the infinite. Maybe you'll think it queer that I left Breen like that, let him go to his room alone, you're thinking that in his condition he might do himself harm, end it all, to put it bluntly. Well, that thought didn't come to me then. It did afterward, but not then. Why? It must have been just the innate consciousness that he wouldn't do that sort of thing. Some men face things one way, some face them another. It's a question of individuality and temperament. I don't think Breen could have done anything like that. I know he seemed so far apart from it in my mind that, as I say, the thought didn't come to me. He was too big a man, big enough to have faced what was before him, faced conditions, faced the men, though God knows they treated him like skulking coyote, if it had not been for her. I want to stand right on this. Breen would never have done what he did if she had acted differently. That much I know, but I want to say it again. I've no right to judge her. Perhaps you've read that story of Kipling's about the Black Tyrone Regiment that saw their dead. Well, Breen, as I told you at the beginning, wasn't popular, and the boys had seen their dead. Do you understand? Pariah, outcast, what you like. They made him, all except pity they gave him, 
and I say he would have taken it all, accepted it all, only there are some things too heavy for a man to bear, aren't there? Load limit, the engineers call it, when they build their bridge. Well, there's a load limit on the heart and brain and soul of a man, just as there is on a bridge. And while one, strained beyond the breaking point, goes crashing in a horrid mass of twisted wreckage to the bottom of the canyon, to the bottom of the gorge, into the rushing, boiling waters of the river beneath, the other crashes a damned soul to the bottom of hell. Kitty Mooney had seen her dead. Kitty Mooney, the engineer's sister. And Breen loved her, was going to marry her, that's all. How do I know? How do you know? Perhaps it was grief, perhaps it was hysteria, perhaps it was according to light God gave her and she couldn't understand. Perhaps it was only wild, unreasoning, frantic passion. I don't know. I only know she called him a murderer. She couldn't have loved him, you say? Perhaps no, perhaps yes. Does it make any difference? Breen thought she did, and Breen loved her. I don't know. I only know that where he looked for a ray of mercy, her mercy, to light the blackened depths, for the touch, her touch, that would have held him back from the brink, for the word of comfort, her word, that would have bid him stand like a gallant soldier facing untold odds, he received instead a condemnation more terrible than any that had gone before. And a bleeding heart dried bitter as gall. A patient, grief-stricken man became a vicious, snapping wolf, an angel Breen, a devil. Would I have been a stronger man than Breen? Would you? Would I have done differently than Kitty Mooney did if I had been in her place? Would you? We don't know, do we? No one knows. God keep us from ever knowing. The poor devil in the gutters, the wretched, ruined lives of women who have lost their grip and drunk the dregs, the human, stranded, battered wrecks we see around us, were once like you and me. We don't know, do we? God pity them. God keep us from the sneer. Our strength has never been measured. It may be no greater than theirs. Tomorrow it may be you or I. It was pretty lawless out here in those days. We had the riffraff of the East, and worse, and there was nothing to restrain them, nothing much to keep them in check, and they did about as they liked. They brought the touch into the picture of the West that the West hasn't lived down yet, and I'm not sure ever will. The brawling, gambling, gun-handling type, the thief, the desperado, the bad man, rotten bad, bad to the core. They've been stamped out now, most of them, but it was different then. They didn't turn a cold shoulder to Breen, why should they? They were outcasts and pariahs too, weren't they? And Breen, well, I guess you understand it as well as I do. And you know as I know that when a man like that goes, he goes the limit. There's no middle course for some men. They're not made that way. Whatever holds them for good or whatever holds them for bad, it holds them all. Either way, all, body, mind, and spirit, all. And that is true in spite of the fact that often enough there's some one thing, it may be a little thing, it may be a big thing, but some one thing that the worst of us balk at can't do. It's not morality, it's not conscience, a man gets way beyond all that. It's a memory of the past, perhaps, a something bred in him from babyhood. I don't know. You can't treat human nature like a specimen on the glass slide under a microscope. There is no specimen. As there are millions of people, so is each one in some way different from the other. You can't classify, you can't tabulate the different kinks into a list and learn it by heart, can you? The man who says he knows human nature says he is as wise as the God who made him, and that man is a poor fool. That's right, isn't it? And so I say that, strange as it may seem, in the worst of us, fall as low as we will, there's generally some one thing our soul, what's left of it, revolts at doing. Breen was a railroad man. Railroading was in his blood. I want you to get that. It was part of him. And any man that's worth his salt in this business is that way. It's in the blood or it isn't. You're a railroad man or you're not. 
Breen disappeared from Big Cloud, and I didn't see him from the day Kitty Mooney turned him from her door until that night, but I'm coming to that. That's the end. There's a word or two that goes before, so that you'll understand. He disappeared from Big Cloud, but he didn't leave the mountains. Maybe back of it all an almost impossible theory, if you like, but I can understand it. Something in him wouldn't let him run away. He did run away, you say? Yes. But uh, there's the queer brain kink again. Perhaps he temporized. You temporize. I temporize. We try to fool and delude sometimes, snatch at loopholes, snatch at straws to bolster up our self-respect, don't we? And that's what I mean when I say it's possible he couldn't run away. He clung to the straw, the loophole, that running away was measured in miles. I don't say that was it, for I don't know. It's possible. We heard of him from time to time as the months went by, and the things we heard weren't pleasant things to hear. He drifted from bad to worse, until that something that he couldn't do brought him to a halt, brought the end. Don't ask me when Breen threw in his lot with Black Dempsey and the band of fiends that called him leader, the ugliest, soul-blackened set of fiends that ever polluted the West, and that's using pretty strong language. Don't ask me how Breen got to Big Cloud that night away from the others waiting to begin their hellish work. Don't ask me. I don't know. Why he did it is different. That I can tell you. What they wanted him to do to have a part in was that one thing I was speaking about, the one thing he couldn't do. Breen was a railroad man. Railroading was in his blood. That's all. But it's everything. Railroading was in his blood. As for the rest, maybe he didn't know what they were really up to until the last moment, and then stole away from them. Maybe they found it out, suspected him, and some of them followed him, tried to stop him, tried to keep him from reaching here. But what's the use of speculating? I never knew. I never will know. Breen can't tell me, can he? And all that I can tell you is what I saw and heard that night. I had the night trick then, Breen's job. They gave me Breen's job. It seemed somehow at first like sacrilege to take it, as though I was robbing him of it, taking it away from him, wronging, stripping, impoverishing the man to whom I owed even the knowledge that made me fit, that made it possible to hold down a key, his key. Of course, that was only sensitiveness, but you understand, don't you? It caught me hard when I first sat in, but gradually the feeling wore off, not that I ever forgot. I haven't yet, for that matter. Only time blunts the sharp edges, and routine habit and custom do the rest. I don't need to tell you that I remember that night. <laughs> remember it. That was before the station was built, and in those days we had an old wooden shack here that did duty for freight house, station, division, headquarters, and everything else all rolled into one. The dispatcher's room was upstairs. Things were moving slick as a whistle that night, no extra traffic, no road troubles, in, out, in, out. All along the line the trains were running like clockwork from one end of the division to the other. If there was anything on my mind at all, it was the limited, number two, eastbound. We were handling a good deal of gold in those days. There was a lot of it being shipped east then. It is still from the Klondike now, you know. And we were getting a fair share of the business away from the southern competition. We hadn't had any trouble, weren't looking for any, but it was pretty generally understood that all shipments of that kind were to get special attention. Number two was carrying an extra express car with a consignment for the mint that night, so, naturally, I had kept my eye on her more closely than usual all the way through the mountains from the time I got her from the Pacific Division. At the time I'm speaking about, four o'clock in the morning, I was almost clear of her, for she wasn't much west of Coyote Bend, fifteen miles from here, and she had rights all the way in. Half an hour more, at the most, and she would be off my hands and up to the dispatchers of the Prairie Division. She had held her schedule to the tick every foot of the way, and all I was waiting for was the call from Coyote Bend that would report her in and out again into the clear for Big Cloud. Coyote Bend is the first station west of here, you understand. There's nothing between. She was due at Coyote at 4.05, and I want you to remember this. I said it before, but I want to repeat it. I want you to get it hard. She had run to the second all through the night. 
My watch was open on the table before me, and I watched the minute hand creep round the dial. 403, 404, 405, 406, 407, 408. I was alone in the office. The night caller had gone out perhaps ten minutes before to call the train crew of the five o'clock local. There wasn't anything to be nervous about. I don't put it down to that. Three minutes wasn't anything. Perhaps it was just impatience, fretfulness. You know how it is when you're waiting for something to happen, and I was expecting the sounder to break every second with the report from Coyote Bend. Anyway, put it down to what you like, though I didn't want to drink particularly, I pushed back my chair, got up, and walked over to the water cooler. The dispatcher's table was on the east side of the room, the door opened on the south side, and the water cooler was over in the opposite corner. I'm explaining this so you'll understand that the door was between the water cooler and the table. That old shack was rough and ready, and I've wondered more than once whatever kept it from falling to pieces. It didn't take more than a breath of wind to set every window sash in the outfit rattling like a core of snare drums. That's why I guess I didn't hear anyone coming up the stairs. It was blowing pretty hard that night, but I heard the door open. I thought it was the caller back again, and I wonder how he'd made his rounds in such quick time. With the tumbler half up to my lips, I turned around. Then the glass slipped from my fingers and crashed into slivers on the floor. My mouth went dry. My heart seemed to stop. I couldn't speak, couldn't move. It was Breen, Angel Breen. I saw him start at the noise of the splintering glass, but he didn't look at me. He clung swaying to the door jam for an instant, his face chalky white. Then he reeled across the room and dropped into his old chair. I saw him glance at my watch and saw his face seem to go whiter than before. Then he snatched at the train sheet, and a smile, no, it wasn't exactly a smile, you couldn't call it that. His whole face seemed to change, light up, and his lips moved. I know now in a prayer of gratitude. You understand, don't you? He knew the time card, knew that number two, after he had seen my watch, should have been out of Coyote Bend four, perhaps five minutes before, but the train sheet showed her still unreported. His fingers closed on the key, and he began to make the Coyote Bend call, over and over, quick, sharp, clear, incisive, with all the old masterful touch of his sending, Breen was rattling the call, CC, CX, CC, CX, CC, CX, CC, CX, and then I found my voice. God in heaven, Breen, I stammered and started toward him. You, what? The sounder broke. Coyote Bend answered, and on the instant Breen flashed this order over the wire, hold number two, hold number two. Twice the sender spelled out the words. Then Coyote Bend repeated the order, and Breen gave back the OK. Breen, I shouted, what are you doing? Are you crazy? What are you doing here? Speak, man. What? He had straightened in his chair, and a sort of low, catchy gasp came from his lips. It seemed as though it took all his power, all his strength, to lift his eyes to mine. I sprang for the key, but he jerked himself suddenly forward and pushed me desperately away, and then he called me by the old name, not much above a whisper. I could hardly catch the words, and I didn't understand, didn't know that the man before me was a wounded, dying man. My brain was whirling, full of that other night, full of the days and months that had followed. I couldn't think. I, Charlie, boy, it's all right. Black Dempsey in the cut. I was afraid I was too late, too late. They, they shot me here. He was tearing with his fingers at his waistcoat. And then I understood, too late. As I reached for him, he swayed forward and toppled over, a huddled heap, over the key, over the order book, over the train sheet that once had taken his life and now had given it back to him, dead. What is there to say? Whatever he may have done, however far he may have fallen, back of it all, through it all, bigger than himself, stronger, stronger than any other bond was the railroading that was in his blood. Breen was a railroad man. I don't know why, do I? You don't know why. After number two had run to schedule all that night, it happened just when it did. It might have happened at some other time, but it didn't. Luck or chance, if you like. More than that, if you'd rather think of it in another way. But just a few miles west of Coyote Bend, something went wrong in the cab of number two. Nothing much. I don't remember now what it was. Don't know that I ever knew. Nothing much. 
just enough to hold her back a few minutes, the few minutes that let Breen sit in again on the night dispatcher's trick, sit in again at the key, hold down his old job once more before he quit railroading forever with the order that he gave his life to send, to keep number two from rushing to death and destruction against the rocks and boulders Black Dempsey and his gang had piled across the track in the cut five miles east of Coyote Bend. I don't know. If a man die, shall he live again? I'll leave it to you. I only know that they think a lot of him out here. Think a lot of Breen. Angel Breen. Now. End of chapter 3 If a Man Die